So I want to thank the organizers. This has been a wonderful meeting uh, and a chance to learn, uh, see so much impressive work uh, on the microbiota. I always like to also say I, I am in the wine department at UC Davis. I am going to be talking about milk. Um, I'm also in the food science department at UC Davis, so I, I work on two great beverages. Um, let me see. We've learned a lot about uh, probiotics in the last hundred or so years, and there's been a lot of nice uh, talks today where people have, have mentioned bifidobacteria lactobacilli in, in one way or another as a probiotic, and I think it, it helps us to go backwards a little bit to see where this came from. I mean, the probiotic concept, of course, uh, emanated from Metchnikoff a long time ago, and, and although uh, while some people say it, he didn't get his uh, Nobel Prize for this. He got the Nobel Prize for, I think, phagocytosis. Uh, and he also was not the person to first use the word dysbiosis. I guess it was a word that was in play at the time. But he used it a lot in, in his uh, pro Prolongation of Life, written in 1906, and, and talked about how one could use fermented milks uh, as a way of reestablishing uh, a dysbiotic microbiota. And his rationale was rather simple, uh, that milks, milks that were fermented didn't putrefy, and he, his vision was that it was putrefication in the, in the GI tract that was causing problems. And so if you drink a lot of fermented milks, you should be able to wipe out that problem. Needless to say, it, it wasn't that it, uh, uh, universally accepted at the time, and if you read Paul de Cruyff's Microbe Hunters in 1926, uh, he made a rather wry comment about the Bulgarian bacillus became the rage, companies were formed, directors grew rich off these silly bacilli. Um, and I, I look at this and I say, well, you know, maybe we haven't gone that far in 100 years. Uh, you know, people are, are, are still selling probiotics and they're getting rich. I don't know if I call them silly bacilli anymore. Um, but of course, we have made a lot of progress. Uh, we know a lot more. Uh, I am going to talk about some of the challenges related to that uh, uh, a little bit later. But what I wanted to focus on is what might be the next generation of probiotics and prebiotics. So before I go to that, I need to get into a little bit of definition of what a probiotic is and what a prebiotic is. So, and there's some misperceptions on how these are used. So a probiotic is a live organism that when administered in adequate amounts confers a health benefit on the host. When administered, and that means it's outside of your body and you're administering it either on or in your body. A prebiotic is a selectively fermented uh, ingredient that, allow, that allows specific changes in the composition or activity, this is the modified new, new description of the gastrointestinal microflora, microbiota, of course, that confers a health benefit as well. Prebiotics do not enrich probiotics unless you've added the probiotic into the body. Uh, so often people will talk about prebiotics enriching the probiotics in the intestinal microbiota. Well, probiotic can only be there if you actually put it there. It might enrich other microorganisms that are in the gut. Um, that are in the same genera and class as, as probiotics, but a probiotic by definition is something you're adding in from the outside. That gets us to the concept of symbiotics, which of course is combinations of pre and probiotics so that you can actually enrich uh, what you are also adding in. We at UC Davis have been very interested in the concept of symbiotics and we're looking for natural models for symbiotic effect uh, and, and landed on one that, that is rather obvious and that is human milk. Because uh, human milk really serves two biological entities, and one is the human host, of course, but also the microbiota of that host. And it actually is involved in establishing that microbiota of the host. Uh, and, and that has also been studied for many, many years. Um, again, about 100 years ago, uh, Tissier uh, identified with, with the high-tech instrument of a microscope uh, that there was a lot of what he called bacterium bifidus in, in breastfed infant feces. Many, many years later, uh, others started to identify, well, what was the factor that might enrich what, what turned out to be bifidobacteria in the feces of breastfed infants and, and identified it as some sort of complex glycan. And you can see the quote there from uh, the work of, of Georgi. So this, this concept has been out there. 
Uh, and, and we've been very interested in what are the factors in milk that shape that microbiota? Well, of course, milk uh, is mostly water, but there's a variety of macro and, and micronutrients. It has a, a fair amount of lactose, of course, and that's food for the infant. It has a fair amount of lipids, it's food for the infant, a fair amount of protein that's broken down is also food for the infant. Also has a huge amount of, of glycans, human milk oligosaccharides. Um, and and I'll, I'll talk about those in a second. Of the agents that are in human milk, there's a variety that shape the microbiota. So there's lysozyme, there's lactoferrin, there's a variety of free fatty acids that can have some either passive or, uh, or active inhibitory effects. So we are suppressing or potentially suppressing that microbiota and shaping it with some of the constituents in milk. But it's the glycans that are also present in human milk uh, that are really intriguing and thought to shape that microbiota as well. And what is, it, what is really amazing about the, the glycans that are in milk is how complex they are and that the various linkages that, that by, by the, how they're put together, uh, uh, the enzymes needed to break those linkages are really not expressed in the human. So you're delivering a huge amount of glycans that the infant can't eat. And so it's clearly aimed at the microbiota and shaping the microbiota in some way, at least in part. And this is a, a representation from a, uh, one of the reviews we've written. It just sort of shows all the kinds of linkages. This is not all of the glycans in milk by any means. Uh, I happen to have the great joy of working with uh, an amazing glycochemist at UC Davis by the name of Carlito Labria. Uh, and he has worked for the last 10 years uh, trying to understand the complexity of human milk glycans and human, free human milk oligosaccharides in particular. And I, I'm showing you sort of a generic structure here just to show you the different kinds of style, fucosyl, linkages, et cetera, that, that compose uh, human milk oligosaccharides. And so they're very complex structures. This is a composite. There's many different types of structures. But when you look at human milk, you'll note you, the, he notices that most of the human milk oligosaccharides are in the 4 to 10 degree of polymerization range. Uh, and, and many of those are fucosylated. Uh, and that's really the bolus of what moms are delivering into infants, and, but there's still a large number of smaller quantity, larger oligosaccharides present. In humans, there's a higher proportion of fucosylated oligosaccharides than silylated, and so far there's somewhere between 150 to 200 different uh, structures. What, are the, what is this bolus of glycans doing for the infant? Well, the, the first and most obvious idea was that those glycans look like the glycans on epithelial surfaces, and so maybe they're just acting as decoys for an epithelial surface, so a pathogen comes along and binds them and flushes out of the infant, and, and that has been demonstrated in a variety of realms uh, and is clearly one of the roles uh, that human milk glycans play. There's also some evidence for direct immune stimulation and also, uh, particularly with regard to the sialic acid and neural development, but we've been focused on the enrichment of specific microbes. In a sense, a prebiotic enrichment coming from human milk. And one of the things I want to point out, and this is a nice slide I got from Lars Bode uh, in San Diego, is the difference in structural diversity that human milk delivers in terms of free oligosaccharides compared to current prebiotics, which are up here on the right. And often current prebiotics are, are, are put forth as very similar to, to the glycans in human milk. And I think you can see from this slide that that's really just not true. Uh, human milk has a range of structures that are present, and one could imagine that it has a, th th that range of structures have a range of activities uh, that, that evolved to be. What is, what is breast milk enrich in infants? Well, I, talk, I talked to you before about what Tissier uh, identified a, over 100 years ago. Well, that has been validated a bunch of different times with non-culture-based studies since. And in general, breast milk enriches bifidobacterial populations. And people have done PCR surveys, and they've done fish surveys. And, and the most recent one, of course, is the, the slide that a lot of people in this talk have been using from Jeff Gordon's lab. Uh, which looked at infants, uh, excuse me, people across time and focused, if you focus in on the infants, uh, particularly during probably uh, the lactation stage or the breastfeeding stage, up to 75% of all babies uh, had, had uh, amplicons that matched to bifidobacterium. 
So in a sense, this is the one common diet we have, and it enriches a very unique and common clade of bacteria in us all, apparently, at least a good chunk of us. Other folks have found, have found the same phenotype, and there's a variety of high level of BIFs. For instance, this is a Japanese study uh, that are enriched uh, in babies, in this case, one month of age. But they also noticed that there's a clade of, of infants that had a low level of BIFs. And it was sort of a split with sort of a, a no man's land in between. Um, and we've noticed the same phenotype in a lactation study at UC Davis. And this is some work presented by Zach Lewis here. Uh, that we notice that babies sort of fall into either a low BIF or a high BIF clade. Uh, and we were curious about that, and I'll, I'll come back to this in a second. But why bifidobacteria? Why would you enrich bifidobacteria, or why would nature enrich bifidobacteria in, in an infant? Well, we can get some clues by the folks who do work on probiotics. And so this is a wonderful work uh, published in Nature a couple of years ago by a Japanese group that was screening different bifidobacteria for its ability to prevent infection of an E. coli 0157 strain. And so they were just rotating different bifidobacteria through to see which one was protective. And they found uh, a couple of strains. Uh, in this one, it was a B. longum that was pr protective against the 0157 challenge. And they went and they sequenced the strain and tried to figure out, well, what's different about this strain than the, than the strains that weren't protective? And they noticed that basically it was the ability, in this case, to consume fructose, to ferment the particular sugar source that was present in the mouse chow. So in other words, and they showed, of course, that, that, that because it could ferment fruit, fructose better, it had the genes for the transport and catabolism of fructose, uh, it produced more acetate, and, it, and they went on to show really nicely how, how acetate was able to modulate tight junction function uh, and, and in a protective way. And so this really leaves one with a rather simple explanation of why bifidobacteria might be effective inside a breastfed infant is that there's a whole bunch of human milk oligosaccharides coming down and they are wonderfully able to consume them and of course one of their major end products is acetate. So maybe that's one of the simple rationales for why this is protective. We have some other work going on with uh, uh, Chuck Stevenson uh, and some folks in Bangladesh who are doing a vaccine trial. And they're trying to understand the impacts of, this is actually a vitamin A study, the impact of vitamin A on their various vac or vaccine uh, responses that they're looking at in the first year of life. And we've been following the microbiota of these kids, and they're all breastfed kids. Uh, and if you look at the data here, these are a bunch of different kids, and they're each measured at three time points, six, fifteen. Uh, 11 and 15 weeks, and they all have a bunch of actinobacteria, mostly that's all bifidobacteria in them, uh, and whereas some of the kids at the far end of the scale here don't. And one of the things they noticed when they started segregating out this data is that the vaccine responses that they were testing were much better in the kids that were more colonized by bifidobacteria. So maybe there's a, another rationale here for why bifidobacteria are protective in, in stimulating a healthy immune response. Okay. Um, Different moms might secrete different types of milk glycans. And I know at a previous talk, we were t uh, it was mentioned how the FUC2 allele uh, expresses 1-2 uh, fucosyl linkage, that's this one right here, on various uh, uh, glycans that are on your epithelium. Well, of course, mother's milk have those same kinds of glycans. And so mo a mom might be a secretor mom or a non-secretor mom. And really, it's whether you produce that linkage or not. So we were kind of curious, is this FUC2 allele linked and the delivery of secretor milk or non-secretor milk linked to any of the differences in bifidobacterial populations that we see? Um, previous studies have shown that, that secretor milk uh, is differentially protective than non-secretor milk. And this is a, a work uh, some time ago by Ardeth Morrow and, and David Newberg uh, that showed different levels of, of the two fucosyl linkage uh, seem to be protective, at least in an epidemiology uh, type analysis. So we were curious if it, it maybe, maybe the secretor, non-secretor separation is the reason we see this separation here. And so we did some, did some looking, uh, and it, it does appear that those moms that were secretors delivering secretor milk into their babies enriched more bifidobacteria. Those moms that weren't secretors uh, enriched less bifidobacteria, at least over time, 
And, and you saw larger populations in case of streptococci or enterococci or, or enterobacteriales. Um, and you can kind of see it better here uh, in terms of the percent babies that with bifidobacteria established from, from either 6 to 120 days of life. Uh, basically, there's more BIFs and they establish faster in a secretor, a baby getting secretor mom milk than one that's, that's getting non-secretor mom milk. And it even separates down to species types, too. We see more B. longums in the secretor babies, as it were, and, and more B. breves in the, in the non-secretor. Well, can you see these, see these glycans being consumed? In the, in the feces, and that's one of the things we wanted to try to understand. Uh, and so working with Carlito Labria again, we were able to uh, simply glycoprofile, it's not simple, but glycoprofile the, the feces, and I would then do the microbiota of the feces at the same time. And so you get a profile that looks like this. This is a, 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 a day, week one, week two, week four, and week 12, and these are a bunch of different mass to charge ratios that represent in a sense, different degrees of polymerization, different glycans. Not at the isomer level, but just different compositions. And you normalize it to the first week, and then you watch it over time. And you can see, uh, in this baby, we see glycans go up a little bit by week two, but then they dramatically drop. And if you go look at the microbiota shifts, we see a large increase in bifidobacteria by week 12. And so we start to see correlations between bifidobacterial populations and glycans disappearing from the feces. Um, and this happens to be a B. longum infantis clade. But Carlito Labria's lab is able to go down to the isomer level. And so they can take any one of those uh, mass to charge ratios and split it up by the various isomers that are actually present and figure out is it a, is it a 1 2 linkage that's going away or a 1 4 linkage that's going away. And so we get wonderfully detailed data on which specific glycans are going away in these poops. And we've been working on this on a variety of, of infants now uh, and trying to map the bifidobacterial populations that are present and the glycans that are missing. But you gotta be careful about uh, associations. There's been a lot of talk about associations at this meeting. <laughs> Even though things look really obvious, you don't necessarily know the order. I think you could imagine a lot of different orders for those. Uh, so you got to be careful on associations, and, and so we need mechanism. Uh, so which bifidos actually grow on human milk oligosaccharides? We've done a lot of screening. Uh, often most of the infant-born bifidobacteria do grow on some of the base human milk oligosaccharides that are present, lactoin tetros, lactoin neotetros. But once you start adding sile uh, oligos or fucosyl oligos, that's when it starts to differentiate. B. infantis, which is actually B. longum subspecies infantis, grows pretty much on everything you throw at it. Uh, B. bifidum also grows on most things you throw at it. B. longum, and that's B. longum subspecies longum, and B. brevi, on the other hand, really just do well mostly on lactoin tetros and lactoin neotetros. Uh, uh, although we have isolated and sequenced and have characterized a variety of B. breve and longum strains that grow really well on HMO, and they, that'll be for a different time. Uh, Justin Sonnenberg, Sonnenberg and Angela Markabal did a, did a wonderful job of examining uh, competition in a notobiotic mouse model between B. infantis, which we know grows well on this particular sugar, lacto and neotetros, and Bacteroides B. theta. Uh, which also grows well on human milk oligosaccharides. And what they did is they just put the sugar into the water uh, at a specific moment in, when they had both organisms in the notobiotic mouse. And when they did that, B. infantis suddenly dominated that population wonderfully. And as soon as they took it out of the water, whoosh, went right down to parity with the Bacteroides. And then when they put the sugar back in the water, it goes right back up. And so we see two organisms that actually are able to grow on the same sugar, but in, in competition in situ in a notobiotic mouse, for whatever reason, bifidobacteria are wonderfully competitive. And we're trying to understand that. We've been profiling the different glycans that bifidos consume. Now, this is work done quite a few years ago, and this is, again, mass to charge ratios across here. And we noticed that that bottom bolus of oligosaccharides that moms deliver are wonderfully consumed by B. infantis, but not so much consumed by some of these other strains. The other strains, again, just consume lactoantetros. But Carlito can look at uh, 
individual isomers. And so we've now been creating heat maps from a variety of strains like this, where the size of the bubble here over this particular sugar represents the, the amount of consumption. And so we start, we're starting to now pattern range of strains, and there's lots of strains differences. Uh, and we can try to relate this back to perhaps what we see in the feces. What about whole genome analysis? Because not all these strains grow on, on uh, uh, human milk oligosaccharides. So we've been comparing the strains that do and that don't grow and sequencing lots of genomes. Uh, this is a couple of representative genomes that we started off with. Uh, and it's rather easy to find the genes associated with deconstruction of these glycans. Uh, they're, they're a variety of glycosyl hydrolases and transporters. And in B. infantis, they stick out pretty nicely in a, in a single cluster. Uh, allows us to make a model. We've done RNA-seq and proteomics and clearly showed uh, that genes unique to, to milk-associated bifidobacteria are, are upregulated uh, during growth on milk sugars, and that gives us a, uh, a model for how this catabolism actually happens. This is a slide that's one slide for two PhD theses. Uh, uh, and so we characterized all of the sialidases, fucosidases, hexaminidases, galactosidases, and the surface binding proteins in B. infantis, and, and showed which ones are induced and which ones are actually involved with human milk oligosaccharides or not. And please forgive me, Dave and Dan, for doing that in one slide. Uh, if you grow bifidos on human milk oligosaccharides, they also bind to CACO2 cells better in an in vitro model. And they in, in, in protectively modulate. They induce tight, tight junction proteins in a protective way and, and anti-inflammatory cytokines. So, and this is really not something people pay attention to. So when people study probiotics, they don't really pay attention to, well, what sugar am I growing the probiotic on when I'm doing the test? And this comparison is with the same strain grown on lactose. And so it's, it's something that, that I would like the probiotic folks to think about. We have to think about what the probiotics are growing on in situ and hopefully design our in vitro tests that we're trying to match that. So we end up with a model uh, where B. infantis is able to de transport and deconstruct these very complex oligos inside the cell. Uh, there's another model for B. bifidum that does most of it outside the cell, and you can imagine how that might uh, create different competition strategies inside the intestine. Uh, we think B. infantis can, of course, compete well, eat all the different glycans, and protectively modulate, and that allows us uh, to make a, 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 an initial proposal that complex milk glycans enhance this particular probiotic effect. But can we translate this? We've been working with Mark Underwood, uh, who works in the neonatal intensive care unit at UC Davis, and he's been doing a study where we put a HMO positive B. infantis into uh, uh, premature infants. Of course, premature infants uh, have uh, a dramatic dysbiosis. Often they're, they're, they're colonized by proteobacteria. And so a common approach to try to help them is to use uh, probiotics uh, of a variety of sort, bifidobacteria being one of them. Uh, and so we were looking at an HMO minus uh, B lactis strain versus an HMO plus B infantis strain. Uh, and this was just, pu just published in Journal of Pediatrics. When, we, when Mark uh, added the B. infanta strain in, uh, when we was feeding formula to these infants, it, it never really colonized at a high level uh, in these infants. But when he fed it to infants that were getting mom's milk, uh, it dramatically uh, rose and, and, and persisted, persisted through the washout, and actually persisted when we added the B. lactis in, you never saw the B. lactis. Uh, and so I think this, is, this gets us to a stage where we start to understand that, that milk can really provide us a model of how to modulate the microbiota and that the specificity of that modulation is driven in part by the glycan complexity that's present in milk and, and this is most important, the cognate bacterial catabolism, the ability of the bacteria to actually consume it. The B. animalis lactis that we used in, in, as the control in Mark's study is what we use as our negative control for HMO growth. Uh, so intelligent understanding of the strains is really critical to be able to partner perhaps with, with specific prebiotics to make more effective therapies. This is a lot of detailed mechanistic research, and of course mechanistic research is in the basic realm, and, but it's also wonderful for translational purposes because it leads to diagnostics. 
We have all sorts of ways of understanding if a bifidobacterium that we put into somebody is actually acting the way we would predict it should. Uh, and that gets to my gaps, needs, and challenges with several minutes left to go. Uh, I like to show this slide, and it, 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 uh, it's a pretty common one when people are talking about uh, metagenomics and the influence on, between the host and the, and the microbiome, in that there's so much we don't know, and we're, we're, we have such wonderful tools now. We're just starting to chip away at all of these subjects. And so when, when we talk about gaps, needs, and challenges, I look at this and I, 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 start, I start, there's so many challenges when I look at it. Uh, but I'm, I'm enthused by the amount of new tools that we have. Uh, within the last five years, we suddenly can sequence uh, in, a, in a normal research lab that, that hasn't been doing microbiome work. I mean, the translatable tools become much more accessible. One of the points I want to make with this slide, and it was made by Joanna uh, Lampy as well, is that we don't take a lot of dietary effects into our microbiota work. And I think this is also a challenge for the food science world and the food industry. If the work I, I show you, I hope has convinced you that if we have a detailed understanding of the structures of our food, we might have a better clue on how they're modulating the microbiota that are enriched inside of us. That can feed back to help us design better foods, not just drugs. Uh, we can hopefully design better diets and foods this way. And so this would be one of the challenges. So I would list a couple of things. Um, there's certainly more mechanistic research needed, and we, we need, not only need to do our systems biology, but we need to get down to the strain level and do examinations at the strain level. Uh, we do need to encourage interdisciplinary research, and Vince is somewhere around here. I want to thank him for saying that before. Uh, we also need to do it in a way where assistant professors don't get lost in that process. Uh, so we need better ways to, to encourage folks to, to enter this field that, that can be part of large, large grants. Um, certainly we need better animal models and continued tool developments, and I'm going to throw glycomics into there. That wasn't talked about so much at this meeting, but we need a lot more glycomics if we're going to study uh, the various glycan structures, and we need to be able to stratify clinical populations. I have a bunch of different examples, and I won't go through them all <laughs> because uh, I don't have any time. Uh, but I will uh, leave that with, uh, uh, I'd like to thank, of course, the team that I work with at UC Davis. I couldn't get anything done without the other professors I work with and the amazing students and postdocs that I work with. It's really a joy. Um, also, of course, acknowledge my funding agencies and my conflict of interest statement. Thank you very much. Okay, and our last speaker of the afternoon is Dr. Brett Finley. And Dr. Finley is professor of the Michael Smith Laboratories in the Department of Biochemistry, Molecular Biology, and Immunology at the University of British Columbia in Canada. Dr. F Dr. Finley?